All right, so here we go with our third part of our video lecture for chapter 14, dealing with the Americas and Oceania. And now we're going to look at South America, of course, at, specifically at the Andean region of South America, which is the home of the Incas. Now, um, let's talk about the origin. So, in Andean, in, in Andean South America, understand that there's a whole bunch of different, like, small societies, small-scale kingdoms, I guess you may want to call them. And uh, they've lived there since, like, forever, right? We mentioned how there used to be the, the Moche, used to be one of those societies, you know, back in the classical era. And before them was the Chavin, right? But all of these had always been pretty small scale, right? No, no large territory and definitely nothing that we would want to call a empire. But then the Incas come along. And the Incas was one of many different societies in South America and the in South America. And they're going to be led by this guy called Pachacuti. And he's going to be similar to like maybe a Genghis Khan in the sense that he will unite the different like societies uh, similar to how Khan united the different tribes of uh, the Mongols. And he is going to expand, Pachacuti is going to expand this territory through conquest, right? Just like the Mongols did. And they're going to build this giant capital called Cusco. Uh, and it's going to be in modern day Peru. And they're going to eventually come in, you know, be, develop into an empire, right? Just like how the Aztecs had an empire in Mesoamerica, the Incas will have their empire in South America. Uh, and it is through conquest and war, right? Um, so then they develop, you know, they, they establish their government. Now, before I continue about the government and the society, when you look at this stat, these uh, walls, right? All right, so he, he, this is modern day uh, Cusco, right? So you have modern day structures next to ancient, you know, Incan structures. These walls you see here with these giant stones. You see more of these kind of like fort type of walls up here. And lo and behold, the stupid llamas right there. But anyways, one thing to point out is that the Incas, um, all their stone structures, they're cut by hand using other stones, which is a very time-consuming process. And they didn't have large animals uh, to pull in or carry these heavy stones. That means a lot of human labor is required. And they didn't have mortar, that like, you know, paste that you would put or like cement that you would put in between like bricks. So this might, re you know, kind of like uh, reflect or recall our memory to like uh, Great Zimbabwe, right, in southern Africa. Great Zimbabwe also had these huge stone walls and stone structures, and they also didn't use mortar either. And um, so uh, we see kind of like parallels, right, between uh, the Incas and Great Zimbabwe in that sense. All right, uh, so the Incas, they create a bureaucracy, right? Uh, so they get their huge empire. Remember, the empire runs across the Andean region, right, uh, of South America, across the Andes. Uh, from, you know, Ecuador and Colombia in the north to Chile all the way in the south. And um, so in order to kind of like administer this super huge empire, the, um, the Incas, they create this huge bureaucracy, right? And the bureaucracy is kind of like they divide the empire into different regions or provinces, and each province is ruled by a governor, and the governor is part of like the royal family. So like the cousin, the nephew, the uncle of the emperor. Now, the emperor is considered to be divine. He's considered the son of the sun, and, and the Inca really m means people of the sun. So the emperor is considered to be uh, pretty much divine. Uh, and in order to, to administer this huge empire, they're going to have to build roads, right? And this kind of reminds us of the Romans, because the Romans, of course, were famous road builders. Uh, and the Roman Empire was very huge at its time. And the Inca Empire... Have, will build somewhere around 25,000 miles of road up and down the, Atlant uh, the Pacific coast of South America, right? And uh, up and down the, the Andes Mountains. Uh, so roads and bridges and stuff like that. Uh, and they would have, you know, rest stops and they would have, like, relays where, you know, one messenger would run uh, to the next stop and pass the, the message forward and then the next runner would, you know, keep on going. Uh, and this would allow them to have centralized rule. 
Uh, and again, it's not a, the hugest, largest empire ever, like say the Mongols, but it was a large empire, especially because it's weird size, right? It's weird shape that it was very long, right? And you would need these Inca roads in order to uh, to uh, be able to have centralized rule. Um, and they would build these roads on mountain sides, right? So you see them going up and up a mountain, and it was you know paved. No, they're not going to be very large because, again, they don't have animals, they don't have vehicles, so they don't need, like, very wide roads, uh, just long enough or wide enough to uh, for humans to, to walk through or run through. Now, uh, we look at their society. Most Inca people were peasant farmers, um, and the upper class were, like, government officials and priests, right? Uh, there was also no social mobility in the Incas. Uh, they, you know, you're basically born wherever you're stuck in, or you're stuck in wherever you're born. And um, all, almost all the government officials were somehow related to the emperor. So it was a very, like, small, tight-knit, um, you know, government agency, right, the bureaucracy. Uh, and they're all kind of, like, related to each other, and they're all, like, you know, no one can move into their society. No one can move into their social class. Now, like every other emperor we've seen, they're going to be walking around with fancy headdresses and costumes because we know the fancier the looks, the more, um, you know, the, the more upper class they are. Uh, so the, you know, the royal family, the nobles, the commoners, right, priests would be in the nobility as well. And again, the fancier the clothing, the more upper class they will be, right? Most, uh, most uh, Incas, I were peasant farmers. And in fact, the, you know, very large population of Peru today uh, is indigenous Inca people, right? Uh, they see here photographed. Now, uh, one unique thing about the Incas, and especially in comparison to the um, to the Aztecs, is that the Incas they assimilated their, the people they conquered. It means that they brought them in, they uh, brought them in and, and made them part of the Inca society and part of the Inca identity. So, for example, they would force the people they conquered to speak the language of the Inca called Quechua. Uh, they would, um, sometimes they would kidnap kids, right? So like you conquer a territory and you tell the territory, okay, from now on you got to listen to our rules and follow our laws and, and listen to our governor. Uh, and the only way to kind of like ensure that, the, uh, that these people that they just, you know, conquered remain loyal is that they would kidnap the kids of like the upper class, of like the ruling class. And they'll tell the ruling class, hey, if you rebel against us, we're gonna kill your kids. Um, so that was kind of like a, a, a kind of like a violent method, uh, but it allowed the Incas to expand and you know rule a large territory. Another thing they would do, which is you know again reminiscent of the Mongols, is that they would relocate people, right? They'll force you know one you know people from one village to go live in an, another village, you know thousands of miles away. And again, this was you know to mix up the population in order to reduce the chance of an uprising or rebellion. So they would bring the people in. Uh, they would uh, intermix them. They would uh, you know kind of force them to work together. And all of this would allow the Incas to establish you know this large centralized rule over an extremely large territory. Now another big part of the Inca system is something called the or Inca rule is the Mita system, which we'll talk about next with the economy and agriculture. Now, um, the, mo since most people were farmers, most, you know, the, the, the main part of the economy was agriculture. And if you notice some of the pictures we've seen earlier in the, of the Incas in, in modern day Peru, it's very, very arid, very dry area, right, up in the mountainside. Uh, so the Incas, they created a system called Waru Waru, Right, uh, which is a fancy word of terrace farming. Let's see if we can find a picture. You know, uh, terraces, right? We've seen them in other, in other societies um, where they, you know, build shelves or steps into the mountainside. And this would allow them to kind of like maximize their rain, um, you know, rainwater levels and use that for irrigation. Uh, of course, you know, what are they farming? What are they growing? Potatoes, corn, and raising llamas and alpacas. Uh, but keep in mind, when it comes to trade, the Incas are going to trade very, 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 very little, right? Um, main reasons is that they don't have large animals. The llamas aren't good for it. They don't have any wheeled vehicles, right? 
And probably the most important reason why they have very little long distance trade is that there's, they live on mountains, right? And mountains are a big barrier to trade. Um, so compared to the Aztecs, the Aztecs also didn't have animals and didn't have vehicles, but they lived in more flat area of central Mexico, allowing them to um, trade more frequently, uh, while the Incas traded very, very little. So the Mita system is a form of labor, right? It's a labor system. And it was a form Now we have to stop recording because Anthony just walked in here and ruined my presentation on the Incas. Sorry. Bye. Thank you. So, now that I've been rudely interrupted, let's get back to it. So, the meat system, labor system used by the, by the Incas. So, basically, uh, as a form of taxes, since they didn't have coins, as a form of tax, the government of the Incas required the people to work for the government for free for a few weeks out of the year, right? So the government will come to the town and say, okay, next week we're going to build a bridge, we're going to build a road, we're going to construct a uh, temple, or whatever. And um, we need people to work. But they're not going to get paid they're not going to get, you know, compensated. This is your taxes, right? So everyone's forced to work a few weeks out of the year for the government, for the Inca state. And uh, they would uh, use this system uh, to construct the roads and bridges and everything else. Sometimes they would ask the people, like, you know, to just simply turn over uh, or to work on, like, state-owned farms, right? So, if, you know, you had your private farms, but then you had, like, your government-owned farms. So maybe you had to work on the government-owned farms for a few weeks out of the year. Or maybe you just had to, like, pay taxes in the form of, like, trade goods, like crops and stuff. So the Mita system was kind of like this forced labor, uh, and it was seen as a form of taxation, right? As a, but it wasn't considered tribute because... It wasn't like that they were doing this to the conquered areas, right? It was more to their own people, to the Inca population. Now, because they didn't have trade and they, their agriculture, uh, you know, even though they had a surplus, it was under, you know, it was restricted, uh, we're going to see that they're not going to have merchants, right? And what little long distance trade there is, like between the Incas and the Aztecs, for example, because they did have some contact. Um, is going to be under Inca control, right? So only government officials were allowed to be, you know, merchants and travel long distance. You didn't have any, like, private merchants looking to make a profit. Now, one of the most unique inventions of the Incas, and, you know, some people can date this invention before the Incas, right? Uh, going way back to the, to the Moche and to the uh, Chavin, is the invention of something called the Quipu, or the Quipu. And this was a series of, you know, beads and knots and strings that they would memorize, and each knot or string was, a, uh, was to symbolize a number, right, and like a numerical value. Uh, and government officials, bureaucrats would have these as a form of accounting of, like, record keeping, like, how much uh, crops have been collected, how many days have the people worked for the Mita system. Uh, what is the population count of the town or the province that they are in charge of? Uh, so this was the only kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say writing system, but it was like a record-keeping system. They didn't have a writing system. None of the Andean societies really had a writing system, um, which is different than Mesoamerica, because, right, the, you know, the Olmecs, the Mayans, and the, and the Aztecs, they all had some type of writing system, but the Incas, they never did, right? They had the quipu instead. All right, Inca religion. So the Incas, they practice mummification, uh, similar to the Egyptians, but not as elaborate. So whenever the Inca emperor died, they would, like, mummify him. And they would keep him around for ceremonies and on, on um, like, on important days, like holidays and stuff like that. And the Inca emperor, the, there was, like, a, this cult. Uh, they call it the Royal Ancestral Veneration. So we you know ancestor veneration is you pray to your ancestors and you hope that they can help you. Um, but the royal family, they would do that for their own ancestors, for other you know, members of the royal family. 
but they will actually literally have the corpse, the mummified corpse, um, you know, present during like wars and battles. Like they, they, they would like carry the, the body uh, into battle and think that the, that the corpse would kind of like guide them and lead them into success. And um, so this is a very kind of like weird uh, version of ancestral veneration, where instead of thinking that your ancestral spirits can help you, is they think that the actual corpse, the dead body, can help them. And uh, the emperors would like ask advice from the, you know, from the mummified corpse, and uh, you know about when to go to war, or who to marry, or how to run the government. Um, besides. You know this weird kind of religious practice. The Incas they uh, they offered sacrifices to their many gods, right? Their their central god was this god called Inti, uh, which was a sun god or the sun god. Uh, animal sacrifices were more common. Human sacrifices uh, happened, but it was very rare. Um, but you know, especially in comparison to the Aztecs, who did human sacrifices pretty much you know all the time, like twenty four seven. And one of the unique kind of like sacrifices is that they'll sacrifice children especially children of nobles who have been uh conquered right of territories that they've conquered so those same kids that they kidnapped right sometimes they would sacrifice them uh they'll put them on top of a mountain and kind of let them freeze to death uh, as a sacrifice to the gods so the inca religion this is inti right this is the sun god of the incas uh, the priests, of course, are part of the upper class. Uh, so, again, no writing system, uh, but they had uh, some use of copper and bronze tools, right, which is metallurgy. Uh, they had masonry, uh, which was more or less, right? No paste, no glue, no cement between the stones. Right here we see some of the huge stones. So imagine these stones weigh, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds, you know, tons and tons. And they're all moved there, they're all placed there, they're all carved into place by human hand, right? No animals, no horses, no donkeys, no nothing. And uh, some of these structures here we see the step, right? Uh, or the, uh, what do you call this? The, yeah, the, the steps. No, not the steps. Oh, God, I forgot what they're called. I just mentioned, you know, what I'm talking about, the terraces, right? The terraces, do you see them here, right? Uh, again, that is to maximize the, uh, the, not only the land that they can use for agriculture, but also maximize uh, the water that they can uh, maintain and keep from uh, after it rains. So here we see, of course, the famous picture of the ruins or the leftovers of Machu Picchu, which is this kind of like uh, hidden Inca um, city. Uh, located in the in the middle of the Andes, right? Very difficult to get there, uh, and this is like a resort uh, where the royal family would go up there uh, during the summer months uh, to stay cool because in, in Cusco would have gotten too hot. And uh, so this isn't like you know how the, you know every Inca got to live only like the wealthiest people got to live there with their servants. All right, uh, Inca decline, right? And we, we're going to see a lot of parallels with uh, the Aztec decline here. So by the uh, late 1400s, the Incas were on their way down, right? And uh, they had a series of rulers who were not that great. And eventually, uh, this guy, the, one of the emperors dies, and then there's um, his two sons go to war against each other because each son is trying to become the next emperor. Uh, so we had this like, kind of like long civil war. And this is already like in the late 1400s, early 1500s. So that means that the Inca army was already weakened because of civil war. And then come the conquistadors, right? This guy called Francisco Pizarro is going to come in. Uh, and he's going to be the leader of the Spanish conquistadors. And they're going to uh, basically overthrow and uh, destroy the Inca Empire. Now, before Pizarro ever gets there, diseases from Europe get there first, right? Because people on the coast of South America, they're going to come in contact with the Europeans. The Europeans are going to accidentally uh, spread their diseases to the people of the Americas, the people of the Incas, and those Incas are going to spread it to others. And eventually, we're going to see that most of the Inca population is going to die or get sick or get infected from uh, diseases like smallpox. That's going to be the big killer. And uh, they're going to die. Uh, so by the time that the, you know, the Spanish conquistadors get there, 
the population is weakened, uh, you know, from disease, but also from war. So it's going to be quite easy, not quite easy, but relatively easy uh, for the conquistadors to come in and finally conquer. Uh, so very similar story that would play out in uh, Mesoamerica with the Aztecs will also play out with uh, the Incas in Andean South America. So the Inca Empire by the late or by the you know, early to mid 1500s, that's when they're going to come to an end, right? Um, but by the end of the post-classical era, they're already on their way down. All right, uh, so we're going to stop here for part three, all about the Incas, and we're going to pick up the last bit um, in our next part. Freaking Anthony. <laughs>